Greetings, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus is that light of life. Turn your King James Bibles to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 30. We're going through all the places where it says, Day of the Lord. Then we're going to contrast that with the day of Christ. This is going to be lesson number 7. Ezekiel chapter 30. Starting in verse 1. Now this uh, chapter is Ezekiel, to the best of my knowledge, was a contemporary with Isaiah and Jeremiah. And when Jerusalem went into captivity by Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar. They were warning the nation that they were going to get spanked. But uh, a lot of false prophets were running around saying, no, that's not going to happen. Don't worry about it. These guys, they're a bunch of, you know, dark, dark clouds that are trying to rain on our parade. Don't listen to them. So... Let's take a look. The word of the Lord came unto me, came again unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Howl ye, woe worth the day, for the day is near, even the day of the Lord, even the day of the Lord is near. A cloudy day. It shall be the time of the heathen. Well, that's interesting. Time of the heathen. Sounds like today. And the sword shall come upon Egypt, and great pain shall be in Ethiopia. Uh, what group of people lives in Ethiopia today? Hmm. And the sword shall come upon Egypt, and great pain shall be in Ethiopia, when the slain shall fall in Egypt, and they shall take away her multitude, and her foundations shall be broken down. Ethiopia and Libya and Lydia, Libya and Lydia, and all the mingled people, and Chub, and the men of the land that is in league, shall fall with them by the sword. Now, Noah had three sons. He had Shem, which was the promised seed line, Japheth, and he had Ham. No, he didn't have uh, a ham for Easter dinner, or, you know, so, no, he named his son Ham. I wonder if that's kosher. Hmm. But, uh, Ham looked upon the nakedness of his father, and Noah cursed Canaan, his son. And I don't know exactly what's up. Sometimes the Bible tells you stuff, but it doesn't go into details. But Ham's descendants, they went into Egypt, they went to Ethiopia, and Libya. That's where Ham's descendants went. That's where his children went. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you should read the book of Genesis sometimes. You might learn something. But my this Bible study is not to uh, trace the family trees of Noah. It's just throwing it out there. Just giving you a little background. If you're really interested in knowing more and proving me wrong or trying to, you can go to Google or whatever and type in uh, the families of Ham. Or you can go to the uh, Blue Letter Bible or official King James Bible online websites and type in Ham. And you'll find and then look up Ham, and then look up uh, all the descendants. 
Now, it was uh, Ham's descendants, the Canaanites, that went into the Promised Land so that when it, Israel left Egypt and was going into the Promised Land, it was the Canaanites, you know, it was the, the children of Canaan, uh, the descendants of Canaan that were there. And if you really know what happened in Genesis 6, uh, you'll know why Israel was commanded to exterminate them. I have a playlist on that called The Angels That Sinned. That's about 12, 15 hours. And if you think the sons of God of Genesis 6 are just good men, uh, well, you should listen to it. Turn off your TV and do a study. The uh, major part of the study was a guy named uh, Clifton Fowler. He founded a Bible college in Denver. I think it was Colorado Christian College originally. I'm not sure. I used to drive by it every day when I, uh, almost every day when I lived in Denver. I didn't go there. Uh, it's probably liberal now, like all the other Bible colleges, but. All right, so Ethiopia and Libya and Lydia and all the mingled people. Do you know what it means to mingle? It means to mix. Let's take a look at the word mingle. Now, when you read the book of Genesis, you will read where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, did, were, were, you know, they were instructed not to intermarry with the Canaanites. Now, the Canaanites weren't just the Canaanites. There were other tribes called by different names. But uh, in Ezra chapter 9, uh, this is like 70 years later than what we're reading in Ezekiel. Israel, Judah had gone into, uh, Jerusalem had gone into captivity. 70 years had passed. If you want to read about the uh, captivity of Jerusalem, you can read the book of Daniel. Matter of fact, King Nebuchadnezzar, who took Jerusalem into captivity. Do you know he wrote part of the book of Daniel by the Holy Spirit? I find that extremely interesting. So let's take a look at mingle. Mingle is not a good thing. Uh, God commanded the farmers not to mingle their crops in other words, don't plant a row of strawberries with a row, row of blueberries, with a row of blackberries, with a row of cherries, you know. Because when the bees came and did their pollination, you know, you don't want strawberries and pollen getting on blueberries. And it, that, you know, are they going to mix? Are they going to grow? Probably not. Okay, so, you know, if you're going to plant a field of corn, well, you want the bees to pollinate the corn, you know, corn with corn. You don't want to corn mix, pollen mixing with the potatoes. I don't think they all mix. God doesn't like mixing. Ezra chapter 9, verse 1. Now, remember, Israel was in the book of Joshua, when you read that, they went into the promised land and they were told to kill the Canaanites, exterminate them. <clears throat> so either the Canaanites had intermarried with the fallen angels, Genesis 6, or God is a homicidal maniac. Take your And like I say, if you want to do a serious study, read the angels that send my playlist on my channel. Ezra chapter 9, verse 1. Now when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites 
have not separated themselves, have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians. Isn't that what we've been reading uh, in the book of Ezekiel? The Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters, their daughters, the daughters of the Canaanites, the daughters of the Hittites, the daughters of the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons. Listen carefully. I This is the King James Bible that demon nominational independent Baptist churches will, and, and will tell you, oh, we believe every word of the King James Bible except for this. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed, we're not talking about apples and oranges here. We're talking about daughters and sons, so that the holy seed have mingled, mixed themselves with the people of those lands. Huh? For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. And when I heard this thing, I rent or tore, I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard and sat down astonished. They mingled themselves. Now, if there's holy seed, that means there is also unholy seed, wouldn't it? I mean, if you have holy angels, you've got unholy angels. What do you think Satan is? So if there's holy seed, there has to be unholy seed. Mingling's not a good thing, people. In Isaiah 19:14, the Lord hath mingled a perverse, perverse spirit in the midst thereof, and they have caused Egypt to err. You know what err means? E R R. It's where they get the word error, as in something wrong. And they have caused Egypt to err in every work thereof, as a drunken man staggereth in his vomit. Well, let's take a look at Jeremiah chapter 25. You know, he was a contemporary with Isaiah and Ezekiel. Jeremiah 25, verse 18. To wit, Jerusalem and the cities of Judah and the kings thereof and the princes thereof to make them a desolation and astonishment and hissing and a curse as it is this day. Pharaoh, king of Egypt and his servants and his princes and all his people and all the mingled people and all the kings of the land of Uz and all the kings of the land of the Philistines and Ashkelon, and Azaz, and Ekron, and the remnant of Ashdod, Edom, and Moab, and the children of Ammon. Listen to this. Deuteronomy 20 and verse 17. God speaking to Moses. But thou shalt utterly destroy them. God's a God of love, right? But thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites 
and the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Wow. You see, people, either God's a homicidal maniac or these people are the children of the fallen angels. You can take your pick. Take a look at Zechariah 14.21. Now this is talking about, this is prophecy, talking about the future. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. Well, obviously it wasn't holiness in the time of Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. And all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and see therein. And in that day, what day? The day of the Lord. And in that day, there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Now I know that there's people they'll quote you Mark 3 318 and they'll quote Matthew 10 4. Matthew 10 4, good buddy. That's a trucking thing, right? Where Simon is called the Canaanite. Now I ask you a question. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but yet he's called the Nazarene, a Nazarene. He's also called um, a Galilean. So which is it? Is it Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus of Galilee or Jesus of Bethlehem? You know, maybe Simon lived in Canaan. You know, if you're born in Texas, you'd be called a Texan. If you were born in New York and lived in New York your whole life, you'd be called a New Yorker. So does that prove that Simon was a, a Canaanite by his bloodline? I don't know. I don't think so. But that's, you know, I'm just throwing that out there. All right, let's go back to Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 5. Ethiopia and Libya and Lydia and all the mingled people in Chub and all the men of the land that is in league shall fall with them by the sword. See, God pronounced judgment upon Jerusalem and he sent Nebuchadnezzar and Jerusalem, Judah, went to Egypt for help. And God's saying, nope, they're not going to be able to help you. Thus saith the Lord, they also that uphold Egypt shall fall, and the pride of her power shall come down from the tower of Cyrene. Shall they fall in it by the sword, saith the Lord God. And they shall be desolate in the midst of the countries that are desolate, and her cities shall be in the midst of the cities that are wasted. And they shall know that I am the Lord. When I have set a fire in Egypt, and when all her helpers shall be destroyed, in that day shall messengers go forth from me in ships to make the careless Ethiopians afraid. And great pain shall come upon them as in the day of Egypt, for lo, it cometh. Thus saith the Lord God, I will, all, uh, I will also make the multitude of Egypt to cease by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He and his people with him, the terrible of the nations, shall be brought to destroy the land, and they shall draw their swords against Egypt and fill the land with the slain. And I will make the rivers dry and sell the land into the hand of the wicked, and I will make the land waste. And I will make the land waste and all that is therein by the hand of strangers. I, the Lord, have spoken it. Thus saith the Lord God, 
I will also destroy the idols, and I will cause their images to cease out of Nuf, or Nuf, and there shall be no more a prince in the land of Egypt, and I will put a fear in the land of Egypt, and I will make Pathros desolate, and will set fire in Zon, and will execute judgments in No. Evidently, there's an area called No, which was my daughter's first word. No! Jessica, get away from that TV. No! Verse 15. And I will pour out my fury upon sin. That's an interesting name. Or is it talking about our actions? And I will pour out my fury upon sin, the strength of Egypt. And I will cut off the multitude of no. And I will set fire in Egypt. Sin shall have great pain, and no shall be rent asunder, and Noph shall have distresses daily. Can you imagine living in a, in a town called Sin in Egypt? Uh, no thank you. The young men of Aben and of Pibseth shall fall by the sword, and these cities shall go into captivity. At Tehaphenehes, boy, some of these Old Testament names. Also, the day shall, also the day shall be sharp, darkened, when I shall break there the yokes of Egypt, and the pomp of her strength shall cease in her. As for her, a cloud shall cover her, and her daughter shall go into captivity. Thus will I execute judgments in Egypt, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And it came to pass in the eleventh year, in the first month, in the seventh day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. That's, this is a figure of speech, you know. Uh, it's kind of hard to fight a battle with a sword when your arm's broken, you know what I mean? I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and lo, it shall not be bound up to be healed to put a roller to bind it, to make it strong to hold the sword. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and will break his arms, the strong, and that which was broken, and I will cause a sword to fall out of his hand. And I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations, and will disperse them through the countries. And I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon, and put my sword in his hand. Wow! And I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon and put my sword in his hand. The Lord's going to make the, the arms of the king of Babylon strong and the Lord's going to put his sword into his hand. But I will break Pharaoh's arms and he shall groan before him with the groanings of a deadly wounded man. But I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon, and the arms of Pharaoh shall fall down, and they shall know that I am the Lord. When I shall put my sword into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall stretch it out upon the land of Egypt, and I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations, and disperse them among the countries, and they shall know that I am the Lord. You know, the Bible doesn't have a very many nice things to say about Egypt, if it says anything nice about Egypt. I think there's one place in the Bible that says something that's not bad about Egypt. But and you got to realize, Egypt, have you ever heard of the Egyptian Book of the Dead? I mean, let's face it, Egypt was full of idols. Egypt was full of heathen, satanic, false gods. Uh, if you've ever heard of ISIS, uh, not the not the uh, Israelis posing as uh, Muslims in the Middle East, but uh, ISIS was the name of a god. Uh, Osiris, Set, uh, they had a bunch of different gods in Egypt. 
and but they didn't worship the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So, all right, well, this is the end of part seven of the day of the Lord. We're going to go through and cover every single time in the Bible when it says day of the Lord. And then we're going to go through and do day of Christ. And then I plan, God willing, to do a commentary on the book of Joel. And when you, if you follow me on all these, when we get to the book of Joel, you'll understand why. Book of Joel ties in with Matthew 24, the end times verses, ties in with Revelation, uh, day of the Lord, day of Christ, uh, the sun being darkened. You know what's interesting is there is a solar eclipse coming a couple of weeks, end of the month in August of 2017. And in the book of Joel, it says that there will be signs, that there would be signs in the heaven, you know, the, the sun would be darkened. I kind of wonder if maybe... Satan will try to trick people into thinking uh, this eclipse has, it will be the fulfillment of prophecy for the Messiah to come. But just remember something. In Matthew 24, Jesus said the false Christ would come first. I mean, when Jesus returns, it's going to be in glory as lightning coming from the east and being seen to the west, every eye is going to see him. I mean, it's there's going to be no mistaking it. And people are, all the sinners are going to howl. It's just, you know, there's no mistaking it. But Satan's going to probably use some kind of modern technology and try to pull off some coming of the Messiah. Just remember, people, the false Christ comes first. Remember that. Just remember that. A lot of people are going to be fooled. A lot of church people that claim to be Christians are going to be fooled because they won't read this book. They won't get on their hands and knees and pray the prayer in James chapter 1, where it says, If any of them lack understanding, let him ask of God in faith. I think I'm paraphrasing there. You're supposed to get on your hands and knees and ask the Lord for understanding. Because if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you will never understand this book. Never. Impossible. And... Uh, you know, there's more things in this Bible that I do not understand than what I do understand. Mark Twain uh, was looking at the Bible. He was a well-known claim to be an atheist. One time he was looking through the Bible and somebody asked him, uh, you know, well, Samuel Clemens. And uh, they asked him, uh, Mr. Clemens, uh, are you a Christian now? And he goes, Oh, no, no, no. And he's like, well, why are you reading the Bible? He goes, oh, well, I'm looking for loopholes. You know, that's what lawyers look for, loopholes, right? There ain't no loopholes, Mr. Twain. There's no loopholes. You're either in Christ or you're not. And there's a lot of Jews... They're going to find out that they're not in Christ. And they're going to find out who the true Christ was. And there's going to be a remnant saved. I believe the Bible in Revelation says that there's going to be like, I think it's seven or 8,000 in Jerusalem that will give glory to the Lord in the, in the final days. So there's going to be a remnant, but that's only like 1% or 2% of the present population. You know, that's that's not much, 1% or 2%. But there's a lot of people, lazy, will not bother to read the Word of God. 
I mean, every time you read it, you're going to find something new that you didn't know before. When I first came to the Lord, I started reading from Genesis 1-1, and I didn't stop until I got to Revelation 22. And every time I had a question and I got it answered, I found two questions more. And you just when you keep digging, the more you're going to find. So, all right, well, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. And that's Jesus, who is the Christ, the Son of God, God who became flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. I love 1 Timothy 3.16. I love this verse. And without controversy. In other words, there's no controversy. This is set in stone, people. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus left his home in heaven to come down to this cesspool of earth to be born of a woman, to suffer hunger, pain, thirst, and the temptations of sin, lived a sinless life, was crucified, buried, and rose again. And the people, that's the gospel. That's the gospel. He lived a sinless life and took on the burden of sin. He that who had known no sin, so that we might be justified through him. He paid the price that we didn't have, that we couldn't pay. And then there's stupid people, like Jehovah's Witnesses, that'll tell you, oh no, Jesus was just an angel, like Michael. He's Michael. Or the Mormons will tell you that Jesus was Satan's brother. Of course, they won't tell you that until you dig deep into their secret society. So, what can I tell you? All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen.